The NES Super Mario Bros. may have been the introduction to the plumber, but it was the successor on the Super Nintendo that made me a fan of the series. Everything seemed better for a lack of words. It looked beautiful, the music was amazing, the controls were quick, and you could actually crouch as a little Mario. I'm a simple man, I know. Super Mario World seemed perfect in my little mind back then, and I have to say, it still holds up. If I could end there, I could, but let's get ahead and start it off with the story. Now get ready, it's gonna be a doozy. Princess Peach has been kidnapped by Bowser and has taken her to Dinosaur Land. See? It's different, because it's a completely different setting. Okay, yeah, it's the same thing, but then again, it was a launch title for a new console at the time, so I can't give it too much flack. Plus, what else were you going to do? Make a new villain and a new setting and a new situation? <laughs> that sounds absurd. So we have Yoshi's Island, Donut Plains, Vanilla Dome, Butter Bridge, I'm sensing a theme here, Cookie Bridge, The Forest of Illusion, oh, are we done with the food thing? Oh, son of a bitch. Well, at least it said it was tasty. And the trail ends with the Valley of Bowser, which has been hinted ever since the Donut Plains, but who cares, there's lightning in the cave, how does work? The world also has a new variety of power-ups. However, if you love the variety of items in Super Mario Bros. 3, sad to say there isn't that big of a variety this go-around. However, there are technically six power-ups, so it isn't too bad of a number. The Super Mushroom, Starman, and the Fire Flower return, but the Fire Flower got kind of buffed, so when a Fireball connects to it with an enemy, it turns into a coin. We're getting full-on Alchemist up in here. But a new proper power-up comes in the form of the Cape Feather. This thing is a force to be reckoned with. Imagine a Tanuki Leaf being rubbed with a Starman. It's that freaking powerful. You can spin attack, float, completely fly if you have a good rhythm. And in the flying state, you can take a hit and still keep the power-up but you will start the fall afterwards, so don't abuse it around hazards and over bottomless pits. The game also introduces Yoshi, a dinosaur companion that was actually planned to be in the original Super Mario Bros. That's kind of neat. Also, heal almost everything, except charging shocks. Those things need to be more obnoxious. I'll talk about them later. But when Yoshi eats different Koopa shells, he'll gain different abilities. Green is just a standard projectile, red spews fire, Blue can grant Yoshi wings, which has to hurt his shoulders from doing that. And yellow grants him a shockwave. But all in all, Yoshi is awesome. I'm glad he got his own spin-off series, too. I need to talk about Yoshi's Island, but I still don't have the game at this moment. One day, though. Oh yeah, the last power-up is the balloon. It's only used in three levels, and it only acts as a temporary hover. Not very useful, really. There are a lot of levels, but there are a total of 96 exits. But wait... Wouldn't that mean there are 96 levels? Well, actually, in many levels, there are two exits, and technically one of them has multiple exits, but it just branches into two pathways. That level is an interesting one. The way you can tell is by looking at the spots where the levels are located. If it's yellow, it only has one exit, but if it's red, it has two. There are also a few ghost houses that contain multiple exits as well, but they aren't as easy to identify. But when you do find the secrets, they may contain shortcuts, new levels, or even nice goodies. Like the secret area when you find a key and keyhole in this ghost house. Yeah, most of the levels with two exits usually have a key and keyhole. But there are two levels that involve you passing the goalpost to find another goalpost. Chocolate Island 3 is easy enough, just use the new cape power up to fly under it. But the one in Cheese Bridge recommends the murder of your new friend Yoshi. Eh, uh, you will be missed my friend. Ooh, three up! Not really worthwhile though, since when you beat that level, you have to go to Soda Lake, the second hardest level in the game with these bullshit tornado Teds. It's like Bullet Bills, only they're torpedoes. It's hilarious. Not really. Fucking jerks. One of the levels that truly stumped me when I was a kid was the one with the multiple exits, Chocolate Island 2. Where you went depended on the number of coins you collected and the amount of time you had. In order to get to the keyhole, you had to collect no more than a couple of coins and get past the second area before the clock passes 250 seconds. No first timer would ever know that unless you sped through the level like a bullet. Bill. Well, speaking of enemies, there are a ton. Some are tame like Goombas and Koopas, including the Super Riety, and a new enemy Rex. But some are, frankly, a pain in the ass. I go back to the charging chucks. They can throw softballs, footballs, dirt? Or oh, you know, call all enemies to murder your ass! Including the other annoyances. Rip. Van. 
fish. Frick you. Frick you. Oh, ninjas. You're kind of the last enemy I would ever see come back from Super Mario Bros. 2, but I will kill you all the same. There are several types of areas that you'll encounter in your adventures. The basic overworld areas, your typical run around level, the athletic areas with enough bombless pets to make your palms sweat, caves, what else do you need to know? Oh shit bats! Water levels, exciting. The before mentioned ghost houses, haunted houses filled with booze, puzzles, and Jelton. Ooh, I knew this stuff would kill me eventually. Fortresses, hidden castles that, for the most part, are difficult, end up with the four Triceratops statues of Resnor. This thing really needs to come back. And the castles, the end of a world that involves the bosses, the Koopalings. And with the exception of this asshole, are the most pathetic bosses I have ever fought. Even more so than some bosses I'll talk about some other time later down the road. Stomp on them three times and boom, dead. However, the cutscenes after beating them are just worth it. This is my favorite. I mean, the hill's gotta have a splitting headache, but it's still funny. Oh, and the fact that you wipe Wendy's castle out of existence is just hilarious. Beautiful. However, as similar as it is, there is one boss that makes me more excited every time I play it. Okay, it looks dumb, the fact that he has a back door doesn't really help, seriously, who doesn't use this? And the fight itself is piss easy. But damn it, dodging his attacks are so much fun and damn, the music is fantastic. There's also a special area called the Star Road, five levels with extremely variable amount of difficulty, but also have a certain way to get to their respective keyholes. Once you lock all five, you will be taken to the special zone, with the funkiest music and the most bizarre names. 80s and 90s slang. I don't know if that dates the game or not. It really depends on the view, I guess. And... Yeah, had to get in there, didn't you? But seriously, Tubular, the second level in this area, can kiss my ass. This is the hardest level in the game. Look at this. Balloons, bottomless pit, charging chucks. Totally fair. <clears throat> Uh, before I forget, most stages have two types of goal posts. There's a midway post that will turn you into Super Mario if you pass it, but every stage has these big goal posts where if you hit the tape, you'll get certain points. If you get 100 of those points, you'll be taken to a bonus stage to get extra lives. Talk about the music, the entire score is fantastic. The athletic theme has always been the unofficial theme in the series for me. The building levels are really foreboding and atmospheric, and the water levels, while obnoxious, are really nice to listen to. And the world itself is so beautiful. A lot of the levels feel so fresh with the different skins. Like the Forest of Illusion having autumn colors, and the Chocolate Island looking like actual cocoa. Seriously, this crap really makes me hungry. And the best thing in the game? The credits theme. It's so perfect. Along with the enemy parade. Look at all the different enemies in the game. Oh. Right, I beat the special world before I fought Bowser, and that's why the Koopas have... Mario masks. Yeah, when you beat the special world, you go to this weird looking place where the Koopas and Bullet Bills are reskinned. Kind of awkward now that I think about it. Ah, uh, it's been two years since I did the Let's Play. And I'd also like to redo my old Let's Plays in review form when I get the chance. But this game, this was one of the first games I've ever played and I still think highly of it. It's still my favorite Mario game that isn't an RPG and possibly one of my favorite games of all time. It really was the game that made me a Nintendo fan, and the reason the Super Nintendo is my favorite console of all time. Oh, along with the RPGs, of course. Check this game out if you can. It's on all the virtual consoles on the new 3DS, Wii, and Wii U. And if it isn't on the Switch, I'd be completely shocked. And of course, getting a physical copy on the Super Nintendo or getting the GBA version shouldn't be too hard to grab, so your options are very broad. Now with that said, I did mention that I wanted to do Yoshi's Island after this, but since my only option is the GBA version on my 3DS, I can't really do much with it at this time. 
then I will go back to Mario at the end of the year when Odyssey is near release, so I will do it then. For now, who's ready for some high-speed action? Next time, I think it's a certain hedgehog's time to shine. I'll see you guys then.